How about now? Can you hear me this way? Here you go. Not going on now. There we go. I All right. I tried going through my phone, but that didn't work. So I'm going to go through my laptop. Let me just put it up on a stand. Yeah, thanks. This is our first time using this system. So <laughs> I'm glad that was a phone end, not a computer end thing. Yeah, it must have been something with the way I use my, my phone for it. How's it going? Good. As good as things can be, really. You know. How about you? Things are good. Yeah, you got two. Today is an easy day for me. All my kids are in school, uh, which is sort of rare. Uh, they're usually kind of bumping around, but Wednesdays, Thursdays, they're in school full time. So that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> good time to knock out Zoom, things like this. Exactly. Yeah. I guess this isn't Zoom, though. So this is basically sort of like Kleenex. We're going to start calling any form of video thing a Zoom yeah. thing, no matter what. <laughs> well, it's funny. You now see these stories about what they call uh, Zoom towns, right? So it used to be Boomtown, Zoom town, sort of rural communities that are, are seeing a spike in people moving there that you know have a high speed connection. And so they can you know move there and do everything they need to do. I think I saw on Twitter, were you in uh, Montana? Uh, I've been around a bunch. Yeah, I was in Montana in August. Then I was in Ohio about two weeks ago. And then I'm going to Florida for work tomorrow. So I try to I try to get out of D.C. as much as possible. It's not really the – I like to say the font of all wisdom is not, is not sort of based in D.C. Basically, <laughs> summing up the nature of today's talk <laughs> right before we started. That's right. Um, okay. Hey, everyone uh, that's here already. We are going to start around 201 so people will have a chance to come in. This is also going to be streaming on YouTube where the video will live after this event. So you can definitely check it out there if you enjoy the conversation. move all my kids toys out of the background <laughs> yeah <laughs> well you guys are killing it with the uh, the podcast the new platform i love listening to it i caught up on some of the episodes uh sunday morning and i really enjoy it i try to turn as many people onto it as i can yeah thank you um and i mentioned we're going to turn this into just a straight recording episode um that will go on fridays so that'll be great good it's really just sort of useful because it helps broadcast these sort of conversations to a way, a way larger number of people than if you just did one sort of format. Hey, everyone. Just a reminder for those who have joined, we'll be starting in around two minutes for those who are still entering the conversation. Also, I have to say, as a podcaster slash Zoom events person, I really appreciate your vigorous promotion of this event. <laughs> uh, you'd be sort of yeah. shocked. You'd be shocked at how bad people are <laughs> about sort of like pushing things out. So I really appreciate that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Glad <laughs> to do it. And it looked like from the online system, you guys had a decent number of RSVPs. So that's good. Yeah. We've, it's, been, it's been good that we've been able to sort of maintain the numbers during COVID. Um, because you always would sort of, I think there was sort of a real burst at the start of April and then things sort of moseyed about in May and June, but we're in a good place. Okay, so it's, I'm going to get started. So 
Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of you who are on the West Coast. Hope you all are staying safe, considering all the news back out there with the fires and other various things. This is the first of the Lincoln Network's reboot conversations that we're using as an opportunity to sort of get really excellent speakers sort of on the record to discuss really important pressing tech, foreign policy, economic policy issues that we're going to sort of see leading up into the election. And a final reminder that we are running our actual reboot conference on November 6th, 9th, and 10th. So if you enjoy today's conversation, we'll have many more just like this leading up to the election and right after the election. So today's guest barely needs any introduction, FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the second time we've sort of spoken in this format and the issues you've discussed have only gotten more pressing. So I really appreciate it. Great to join you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate doing this. And I'm also a big fan of the podcast that you all do out of the Lincoln Network, uh, The Realignment. Uh, try to listen to that and catch up to your episodes. You guys do a really good job. And also the intro music that you do. I don't know who came up with that, but every once in a while it gets stuck in my head. and I have to play that on repeat as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's so many things to talk about today. Obviously, tomorrow is the ending of the public comment period for the Trump administration's uh, proposal on Section 230 with the FCC. There's the antitrust investigations that state attorney generals are launching at big tech companies. There are obviously the antitrust hearings that happened earlier in the summer. But the area I want to sort of start with, and this is the thing that I've noticed people are most interested in from your perspective is, could you articulate your sort of approach to the world, your sort of general worldview? Um, I've seen in previous pieces, you said you're a free speech person. That's one of your biggest um, objectives when it comes to approaching these issues and that you feel that you've had a consistent trajectory throughout your time at the FCC. But this is sort of where the contention comes in. So could you articulate your sort of perspective on that? Yeah, I think at its core, when it comes to a lot of these issues, I'm in favor of more speech, a diversity of views, uh, empowering individual consumers to make their own choices, whether it's, you know, having fact checkers that often sort of screen these posts before you get them. I think we should empower people. And I think my views, you know, tie into this broader trend towards, uh, you know, pushing back on concentrations of power, whether that's power is concentrated in the hands of big government uh, or whether that power is concentrated in the hands of big tech. I think a lot of people have this sort of difficult time uh, reconciling a Republican, a conservative, with someone that is willing to push back uh, against things that big corporations want. And I think a lot of people don't understand there's a wide and, in fact, widening gulf between being in favor of free enterprise and being pro-business or what I call abject corporatism. So I think we can adopt regulations that are going to promote individual liberty and push back on the concentration of power. I think that gives a lot of people pause and they have a hard time sort of getting their head around people that articulate those types of approaches. So could you speak to what, to power, this sort of idea of like, can you speak to what you think concentrated power is? Because as you were sort of saying, this isn't as much a topic that right-leaning politicians, officials, thinkers have focused on, at least publicly. So it seems confusing to people when someone like you speaks that way. Yeah, I think this is part of, um, part of why I think this debate over big tech is so interesting, because I think it's wrapped up in this broader debate about the future of the conservative movement. And I think you know, for Democrats, they kind of have laid out their path on these issues. A lot of it is about, you know, breaking up big tech, you know, banning mergers. Uh, that's not where I am. But I think do think when you have uh, unique examples, and I think there are still, um, you know, these are sort of edge cases, but where you have unique examples of concentrations of massive power, uh, I think there's a role for the government to promote, whether it's competition uh, or sort of an appropriate light touch regulation, right? So I sort of advocate for this light touch regulation, but that's very different than saying no regulation and corporations should have carte blanche. I think, again, it's it's confusing to people as a, an increasing number of conservatives articulate that issue, but I do think that's the future of direction of where, where so many of us are going. Could you articulate the difference then between the sort of democratic approach and your sort of approach and where and why you specifically disagree with the democratic approach, because something you've spoken about earlier in previous appearances is that there is this bipartisan critique 
of concentrated power, you know, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Facebook, but when it actually gets into the specifics, there's a broad amount of disagreement. So you just said you're sort of opposed to sort of the breakup talk, but, but how exactly are you and why are you opposed to that sort of approach? Yeah, I think there is, again, an appropriate light touch approach for regulation, but government can certainly go way too far. And a lot of the, the Democrat proposals that I've seen do that. Another interesting example, I think, is this debate over net neutrality. So the approach that a lot of Democrats have embraced on net neutrality is to impose utility style regulation of the Internet, which subjects Internet providers to everything from you know rate regulation to really dictating where they can put their uh, infrastructure. And I think that, as we saw, really decreases investment. And that's not a good thing for anybody that wants to get more Americans connected. I think the counter approach to that, the Republicans and many of us have embraced is, you know, not no regulation at all. We have not given internet providers carte blanche to determine your online experience. Among other things, we have this transparency rule that we impose on internet providers. So if they're going to block your access to a lawful content, they need to disclose that. And that will then be enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. I think a lot of people describe what we did on net neutrality as, you know, no holds bar, giving internet providers carte blanche. But I think when you actually look at what happened, that's actually a good example of, I think, where we need to be going forward. Not zero regulation, not no regulation, but leaning on transparency to try to get the result we want, which will also enable these platforms to continue to flourish and build out and do this multi-billion dollar investment we need. I think that's the right touch. So could you, the, the obvious sort of newsy item that we're sort of thinking about is sort of the FCC's public comment period, how the Section 230 debate is going to sort of manifest itself. Could you speak to how, what, what do you think the FCC's role in the debate over Section 230, which is, as we've talked about, is a broader debate about the role of speech and platforms um, online. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think the debate over Section 230 is really fascinating to me, and, and it is so for a couple reasons. One is that there's really three or four different types of debates taking place at different levels of, uh, of sort of technical specificity. At its highest level, I think it's the debate that we touched on, which is, you know, is there a role for the government here or not? And I think from my perspective, when you look at the way that big tech has amassed its power, the abuses that we see, I do think there's a role for government. Now, when President Trump stepped in and, and sort of called for the FCC to look at Section 230 reform, I think that sort of scattered a lot of people as as that as tends to happen in Washington. If if Trump is for it, there's a lot of people that are against it. But there is bipartisan support, right? So Vice President Joe Biden was in favor of Section 230 reform, or in fact said that we should revoke Section 230. So there's these high-level debates that take place. And then when you drop down, though, uh, the Commerce Department filed this petition with the FCC, and it's actually pretty specific, and it very quickly gets into the weeds about particular provisions of Section 230, what we call C1 and C2, and how do those two provisions interact? And I think that's a fascinating discussion, but again, in, in some ways, that's a parallel discussion to what we see uh, that gets covered on sort of Twitter or the, the quick TV hits. And in, in a nutshell, the way I view it is this way. When Congress passed Section 230, we had um, relatively minimal content moderation going on on platforms like Prodigy and CompuServe messaging boards. Um, and before Congress passed 230, we had positive law, whether common law or state law, that had been putting a thumb in favor of very little moderation because before 230, there was a concern if a provider, a platform heavily moderated their platform, that they would have exposure to liability. So we had law that was speech influencing or conduct influencing in a way against moderation. Congress stepped in with 230, talked about doing it in a balanced way, and it's been speech influencing, I think, sort of too far in the other extreme, which has given uh, providers, uh, I think, too much of an incentive to moderate content. So I think what NCI did in the actual specifics of its petition was try to go back to what I think is viewed as potentially an original approach to 230, which is how do we strike the right balance in that there's been some court cases that have really taken 230 in an expansive direction. I think we have uh, created far too much of an incentive for censoring and moderating content than uh, what I think potentially Congress intended when it passed that law. Could you speak to that incentive then? Because I think that's where we're going to sort of see this debate start, which is, 
isn't the sort of point of section what what, is, what, a, what a critic of this approach would say is actually section 230's point is that if you want to moderate as much as possible you can moderate as much as possible if you don't want to moderate you don't moderate so where can you speak to how the incentive system is leading to a situation where you think there's too much moderation i would certainly agree with you that sort of under the case law as it exists uh courts really read 230 as giving providers carte blanche to do as much or as little as they want but there's another interpretation of the statute, which is basically that uh, this operative language, uh, 230C, uh, talks about Good Samaritan blocking and screening. And I'm, I'm referring to the actual text of the statute here. One of the provisions says, in good faith to restrict access uh, to a series of types of content, obscene, uh, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, sort of gets these special 230 protections. And effectively under the case law right now, that provision C2 doesn't really even come into play. Courts look at this predicate provision of C1 and basically say, look, anything that goes on these platforms, there's no liability. I think part of what the NCIA petition does is how do we get back to reading some relevancy or more relevancy into C2 and, and looking at, was this a good faith takedown of conduct? Was this truly a objectionable content in the way that 230 meant. Now, those are hard questions. I'll be, I'll be the first to admit that, but they're questions I think that Congress teed up. It's a line in the sand that Congress drew that has been blurred. And so I think we should return to trying to add some more content to that. I think that could have, um, again, this entire regime is conduct influencing. I think the upshot of that could be one that you know gets back to more speech, more content, and letting consumers decide for themselves um, you know, what they want in their feeds or yeah, not. There's a, there's a lot of uh, good stuff there. I think why I'd start with a, can you define good? I mean, obviously these are legal terms um, and I'm not one to define legal things, uh, but define like good faith for us sort of. So, wait, so if, if we're sort of thinking about the conduct of platforms, what, what, what do you think would constitute good faith conduct? What would constitute bad faith conduct? Yeah. Well, one thing we have to look at, I think is the, the representations that these platforms make, whether it's, you know, publicly to the extent they're binding, uh, binding commitments or in terms of service. And if you tell the general public, hey, come to my platform for all the content moderation that I do, I'm not going to engage in political takedowns. But then in fact, you know, you do, uh, I think acting inconsistent with your public representations could be a showing of lack of good faith. Now, that doesn't mean that a platform can't come forward and be more specific in my mind and say, look, we're going to be a right-leaning platform. We're going to be a left-leaning platform. Um, I think that could sort of give them some cover for engaging in partisan political takedowns within the meaning of good faith. But good faith also obviously is a general uh, sort of legal standard and ultimately uh, fleshing out what that means would be something that would be applied by courts the way they apply that type of standard um, in other contexts. The other piece of that from the petition is this concept of otherwise objectionable, right? So the, con the statute says um, platforms can take down you know, violent content, um, obscene content, and then there's this bucket for otherwise objectionable. And right now that otherwise objectionable bucket arguably is, you know, anything that we want at all. And there's, a, I think, a legitimate question that NTI tees up about, should we read otherwise objectionable as being in the same type of category of things that Congress otherwise specified and maybe not being carte blanche? Because again, you know, when you look back at the Prodigy and CompuServe messaging boards, um, there was very little moderation going on. There wasn't sort of this political moderating going on back then. And also people didn't build their livelihoods on the CompuServe messaging board. If you got, you know, the, the version of deplatforming from CompuServe, you could, you know, live your life, you could still generate your business. But now these platforms have be created an opportunity, whether it's, you know, YouTube or Twitter for people to build their own business and they have to be on these platforms. And so the consequences of deplatforming uh, are much greater today. So again, I think, when you look back at what did Congress have in front of it in the 1990s when it passed this law, um, I think it might have struck a different balance had it seen the way that people are using these platforms today. And again, the nature of content moderation, it was very little going on back then. And now you've got just a massive amount of moderation. So, you know, some people would say that's great. Then you should go to Congress to amend the statute. I understand that. I also think we have a role at the FCC, though, to look at the language and the words that Congress did pass. So that's actually really helpful, and that gets us to defining the problem, right? Because deplatforming, that'd be a, an example of how you have an issue in the sort of ecosystem. But the deplatforming 
critique is different than the debate over fact checking, which is different than the debate over sort of this, you know, whether these you know, platforms are conducive for speech. So could you, from your perspective, define the problem that we're trying to address in the year 2020 when it comes to these platforms, <laughs> right? In 30 <laughs> seconds or less, obviously, we make it simple. <laughs> yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of issues out there. And part of that is that every single complaint that people have about social media is not something that can be solved through 230 reform. And that's part of why when I've laid out sort of my more comprehensive vision for big tech reform in this news we got bad. I touched on things outside of 230. So there I laid out these ideas of transparency, which I think we can do with the FCC through a transparency rule, similar to the one that I laid out uh, earlier in our conversation for internet providers. I think accountability, which is where I think the Federal Trade Commission could be doing a lot more with respect to these representations that social media companies may not be living up to. Uh, and I talked about user empowerment, which is finding ways, and maybe we can do this through 230 reform, um, to empower consumers to make their own decisions about what they see on the internet. So if you're a consumer and you want Fox News to filter everything before it hits your feed, I think you should have that choice. If you want MSNBC to filter it before you see it, I think you should have that choice as well. But how do we empower users? Because 230 was about that, right? 230 is about how do we make sure that users have the tools to decide what content they see? And I think we've moved away from that. So if we're looking you know, wholesale at the issues with big tech, I think you know, they're manifold. And I think some of them are outside of 230. Look at the advertising market. There's a lot of concern we've seen with Google's dominance in the ad market that right now, if you want to be a going concern in today's economy, you have to have a web presence. And, you know, advertising is a big piece of that. And how do people find your business? And we've seen a lot of reports about Google manipulating search results, manipulating their algorithms that can drive traffic to sort of bigger established incumbents and almost overnight turn the spigot off of small businesses' web traffic. So, I think there's a lot of issues out there, and I think big tech is unique right now, right? It's We have nothing like it in terms of the amount of power and control it has over our daily lives and the almost non-existence of regulation. Again, ISPs, which people hold up as the sine qua non of an unregulated industry um, under our approach at the FCC, is much more heavily regulated than big tech, but it exists in a void. Now, people can counter to me and say, well, that's why it's, you know, generate so much innovation. That's why there's so much job. That's why it's so much economic activity is the, is the complete lack of regulation. But uh, my response to that is I do think that we can hold these platforms more accountable, bring some light touch regulation and maintain all of that um, innovation that really has made the U.S. internet platform the envy of the world. Yeah, so that's really helpful. So um, before we, and you teed it up well, before we transition to the news we got by, which I think really sort of sets, you know, sets the tone for the debate going forward well, could you respond to this sort of generic response you sort of see people on the left especially sort of say, which is that we're talking about this conversation when it comes to bias and the power that tech companies have. If you look on social media, if we went to Facebook right now and said, what are the top 10 best performing pieces, they'd actually probably be conservative. You know, Ben Shapiro does a lot better on Facebook than MSNBC does. So what they'll sort of do is they'll sort of sidestep the more, not philosophical, but the sort of like broader debate you're having here and look at this operational issue here. And this is also something libertarian people on the right say too, which is that, Brendan, what are you talking about? There's no problem. Conservatives are doing very well on these platforms. There's more conservative speech on these platforms than ever. How does that, I think, empirical argument fit into the broader conversation we're having? Yeah, something relevant to this I saw recently, there was um, Senator uh, Brian Schatz, Democrat Senator from Hawaii, uh, quote tweeted an article that talked about how the top performing um, publishers on Facebook tend to be right leaning, whether it's you know Daily Wire, Breitbart, um, and he sort of had a comment that suggested that Facebook is not a neutral platform because those conservative websites are are doing well there. So I'm I understand that, and people also harken back to this concept of the fairness doctrine, and they say that it was the FCC eliminating the fairness doctrine for broadcasters that ultimately led to a thousand flowers blooming in sort of conservative talk radio. Now, I think the analogy between the Fairness Doctrine and 230 reform is not an apt one, um, but I do think there's something to be said for uh, the conservative voices that are flourishing out there, but that doesn't sort of speak to, I think, the power that these platforms have and a lot of the you know silencing of voices that we've seen out there. Again, it's, it's not always just a one-way ratchet, right? It's not just conservative voices that are uh, struggling uh, with some of these censorship issues. So I think as we go forward and craft 230 reforms, I think we need to do 
do so mindful, not of, you know, aiding one, you know, particular voice or another, but something that is going to, you know, make sense in terms of empowering all consumers of all political stripes to have more uh, sort of control over the content in their feeds. Do you think it's possible, given the sort of hyperpolarized, hyper-nationalized state of our politics, that you can have platforms that are neutral, either philosophically or operationally? Um, you know, because it seems that Senator Satz is basically suggesting a neutral Facebook would be one where five of the top 10 are Democrats, five of the top 10 are Republicans. Is that something, are we sort of striving to sort of an idealized past that, I mean, you could sort of hint at where my direction I'm going with it, but is that sort of even possible? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not aiming to sort of neutralize platforms politically. I think what we have here is, you know, again, Section 230 being a unique set of protections that apply to these platforms that are above and beyond the First Amendment rights that all of us have, right? So you can get rid of 230 entirely and you still have, you know, your First Amendment rights. So, but I think some greater transparency would help if, you know, random social media company says, look, we are going to be the, the right-leaning platform. And another one says we're going to be the left-leaning platform. I don't have an issue with that. But right now, I think what we have is a lot of sort of representation about um, how these platforms are sort of open for a diversity of views and people feel like they're not. So I think some greater transparency there would help. And I think there, this, this black box idea, it's just not helpful. So people on Twitter can see their followers, you know, drop by a thousand overnight. And maybe that's because people uh, stop liking their content. That's entirely possible. Maybe it's because these were, um, you know, Communist Party inspired bots, but people don't know. And they fill that void. They fill that black box uh, with different theories as to what's happening. And a lot of those theories, uh, you know, have to do with, you know, political bent. So I think if we can get to more transparency and then holding these platforms accountable to those public representations, um, I think that would be progress. And that does not require um, you know, mandating that every single platform be um, neutral politically. That's interesting. So and you sort of referenced this earlier when you said sort of when you talked about the terms of service loophole that could happen. But what is, I mean, what is stopping a platform? I'm going to put on, let's say, my Twitter hat, for example, from saying, look, Brendan, we're not a left-wing platform. We're not a right-wing pl platform. We are a platform where speech happens. You know, this is the public square and we call balls and strikes. And if it turns out that, you know, the right is striking out more than the left, like that's an issue for the right. And we're just simply doing that. That wouldn't require us to declare that we're a left-wing platform. How, and then, so yeah, so that's, that's what their obvious res response would be. Um, and then too, it seems to me then that what that would suggest is people would just probably become much more specific with their terms of service. So they would simply admit that they're not quite this sort of philosophically hyper free speech sort of place. So how would we think about that in a world where the FCC is greater involved? Yeah, I, mean, I think that the disclosures matter. So, you know, when, Twitter was growing when it was sort of gaining the network scale and power that it has now. It said that we are sort of the represent the free speech wing of the free speech party that attracted a lot of people to it. Um, it gives it power uh, through the network effect. And there's a lot of people that question that now. And we don't see quite the same uh, representations from Twitter now. But I do think some competition could be part of it. And you do see some of that with Parler and others trying to carve out different uh, niches in the social media space. But again, all of that would be perfectly fine and is perfectly fine against the backdrop of playing by the same rules that every other political speaker plays by. But with 230, you know, you get this special liability protection. And I think um, narrowly in the weeds of 230, it came with some uh, I don't know if conditions is the right word, but the statute has words in it that have meaning that I think have gone by the wayside. And so I think, you know, we can uh, get back to Section 230. Um, and understand that if you're going to have these special benefits, you got to fit within the terms of the statute. That's not to say that someone can't tap out of 230 entirely and say, look, I don't want um, you know those liability protections or they're not necessary to me. I can do a lot more things algorithmically than I could do before to manage my liability. I want to be just any other First Amendment actor and I'm going to be you know as biased or not biased as I want to be. But if you're going to take the benefit of those special liability protections, I think you got to be held accountable to the way that Congress defined the limits of those protections. So 
on to the sort of op-ed and the sort of the, the, the broader conversation you have there. So as, as, as you sort of pointed out, you sort of had three um, guiding principles. Can you just reiterate those and sort of how, and speak, because we've been focusing on Section 230, as you said earlier, it's a broader conversation about sort of the way the right's thinking about these issues. Actually, this is a better way of, this is a better way of phrasing this. You sort of open up the op-ed with an idea that the right faces a choice when it comes to tech and these sort of platforms. It's sort of either um, change or effectively stick with the status quo. And you say that's a false choice. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I do think that, you know, this is a microcosm for this, this broader debate. I think uh, a lot of Washington and the, the policy think tanks today are dominated, um, or at least there's a strong influence by this sort of libertarian thread of thinking. I think some of that for some people morphs into this abject corporatism. And so I think for a lot of Republicans, the fork in the road is basically, do we sort of sit on our hands and do nothing? Uh, or do we do something in the face of this massive accumulation of power? I think it's easy to say, you know, look, let's um, not change anything. Um, these platforms are creating jobs, they're leading to investment. Um, but I think when you step back and see that, you know, this is not simply, you know, competition in a free market, but it is taking advantage of a landscape that's been skewed by law, Section 230 included, uh, to favor their business model over other business models. When you look at it that way, I think that supports, you know, stepping in and, and, and looking at reform. So how would you, and speaking of um, sort of power, and how these things are operating in a context beyond just the free market, the obvious sort of thing that comes to mind is the debate over China, um, the CCP and sort of their tech companies. The sort of response that a lot of people are sort of coming to is sort of, yes, it's true that these things are powerful. They have all four sorts of forms of concentrated power, but that concentration and that power is necessary to check the power of Chinese companies that oftentimes, not oftentimes, are always supported by this, the state in various sort of ways. How do you think that dynamic comes in because because like, what's interesting when you talk about the people on the right is that half of the people I talk to sort of agree with that framework and the other part of the framework says that's a total bad faith thing just as recently as 2016 these companies are trying to get into the Chinese market so this is a PR play. how you know so how do you how do you think about that dynamic yeah I think the argument about needing size and scale to compete with China is a better argument in the face of Elizabeth Warren style you know, break up big tech arguments. But I think when you're coming from my approach, which is um, let's have some regulation, some light touch regulation, some greater transparency, I think that that reform is not something that would uh, depress Facebook, Twitter um, to such a degree that um, CCP backed companies are going to dominate the cyberspace. So I think it's an interesting argument. Again, if you're, if you're sort of talking about breaking up big tech, um, but I don't think it's an argument for no regulation at all. So it's interesting that you keep using sort of the light, the light touch reference, because as I understand it, a lot of your critics, frankly, are suggesting that your rhetoric and policy positions are outside of that light touch tradition or sort of like working towards their sort of own thing. So I'm interested in sort of how you sort of square that or if that even is something that needs to be squared. Yeah, I think part of this goes back to sort of this, you know, this conversation that we're having about sort of the future of the conservative movement. So a lot of people, I think really a lot of people on the left, they look at a conservative Republican like me and they say, look, you, you know, eliminated utility style regulation of the Internet. You are for carte blanche. You're for no regulation. You are for, you know, whatever the corporation wants, you're going to give it to them. And then when you say in these contexts, you know, look, I'm for light touch regulation. I, I actually was there on net neutrality with this transparency rule. I think we should bring that same transparency rule forward um, into big tech. You know, it it's like it's a binary world for them. Either you have no regulation or, you know, heavy handed regulation. That's why I think, you know, there's a middle path here that we can chart. And I think that's why my approach to net neutrality is consistent with my approach to big tech, which is some light level of regulation, not carte blanche. And I think that's some of it, I think, is, is good faith confusion. Some of it, I think, is just is bad faith sort of confusion of saying, you know, you're against regulation there. How can be for regulation over here it, without really grappling with the actual thing that we're talking about? And the sort of broader debate that we're sort of fitting into um, 
and this is why it's important that your sort of history at the FCC begins before 2016, is that there's this debate about is sort of this Trumpian moment, sort of the transformation of the Republican Party in different ways, a permanent change? Or is there a world where in December 2020 or in December 2024, we sort of go back to what sort of came before, to sort of this sort of more liberal, I would sort of say on tech policy, at least, it would seem a lot of people's perspective was very libertarian, if people were even sort of thinking about it at all. I don't think that this was traditionally an issue of right was sort of that interesting. What's your, what's your perspective on that debate? Yeah, this is a question that, you know, obviously is, is hotly debated. I do think that, you know, for many of us, um, you know, the future is not going to be, you know, some sort of extreme libertarian approach and abject corporatism. I do think that the future is going to be some sort of uh, form of, you know, of light touch regulation. I mean, again, when you see just the, the massive concentration of power and the way that can be applied to you know, stifle speech and shut down speech. I do think across the board, there is going to be a realignment within the conservative movement. And I think the upshot, um, you know, regardless of uh, the presidential election this cycle or otherwise, is um, a growing body of conservatives um, that are for addressing big exercises of power by, by corporate America. Um, and I also think that that part of the challenge is there's not a lot of infrastructure in D.C. right now to support that type of thinking, right? There's a handful of newer um, uh, sort of think tanks or think tank lights that are here. But, you know, the vast majority of the established think tanks um, are pretty focused on, again, what I would view it, and they wouldn't view it this way, but what I would view as sort of abject corporatism and whatever sort of a big company wants is what um, anyone with a Republican next to name should be delivering. And so you've got these massive institutions in D.C., that are you know very active on Twitter. I'm sure they'll be uh, active on Twitter after this conversation as well. But I do think you know part of it is how do we build up um, within DC uh, a greater structure to support people that are uh, more interested in, in preserving free enterprise and not just you know big business. Just a quick note for everyone. Um, I want to. We're going to transition into um, Q and A if that's okay with you, Commissioner Carr. Um, in about uh, 10 minutes, I just want to go over the last parts of the op-ed. So please uh, place your questions into the chat and we will go from there. Um, so yeah, I just want to put some meat on the bones of the framework of transparency, transparency, accountability, and user empowerment. Because I think that's the part here. This sort of speaks to the broader Section 230 conversation that I think sort of give some clarity or sort of thinking on this. So first, transparency, we sort of talked about this a bit earlier, but could you articulate exactly how the user, tr the, the transparency of decisions would sort of work? I think this is reference to like ISPs and sort of the FTC. Could you speak to that? Yeah, so in the ISP context, the internet provider context, we right now require detailed disclosures, really about any practice that would shape internet traffic. So if you're blocking, if you're prioritizing, if you're discriminating against content, you have to make a pretty detailed disclosure under FCC rules right now. Any violation of those disclosures is um, enforceable by the Federal Trade Commission. So that's different than perhaps the way it is right now with big tech, where they can have a very um, sort of encompassing statement in a term of service that basically says, we can do anything to anybody for any reason. And it's not really much of a promise, and it's very difficult to enforce that. So I think if we could provide some more transparency. And I'll be the first to admit that it's not the easiest thing to do uh, where the rubber meets the road, but I think we should try to bring more transparency there. And then these platforms can be held accountable when they act inconsistent with their representations. And I think the FCC has authority, the same way we did for ISPs to adopt a transparency rule to adopt one um, when it comes to big tech as well. What, what, what is the, do you, do, are you aware of what the sort of what is quote unquote big tech's response to that argument about transparency? Have you sort of encountered any sort of pushback to that framework? Yeah, I think look, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of legitimate pushback to a lot of what I say, uh, and I, I welcome the feedback. In fact, the FCC's proceeding on Section 230 had something like over seven thousand filings in the last uh, thirty days or so, which is not quite net neutrality level, but still uh, a fairly high level of activity. Um, uh, when it comes to the FCC's docket. So I think the pushback on some of the transparency stuff is exactly in the implementation. It's, it's difficult. How do you do this? Content moderation at scale is hard. How do we really flesh out every single thing we're doing, every nuanced decision? How do we say that ahead of time? And, and I understand that there's um, 
challenges to that, but I, but I still think, you know, that we should, that we should try. And when we talk about the FCC's docket, I was actually happy with uh, sort of the diversity of views that were expressed there. If anything, I thought uh, there was more support for Section 230 reform than what I would have thought. You had even entities like AT&T filed in support of Section 230 reform at the FCC. Um, and so I think that's helpful in terms of understanding that, you know, this isn't something that's just a few, you know, extremist people uh, hold this view that, you know, we're seeing people from across the political spectrum from, you know, AT&T, CNN's parent company, uh, supporting Section 230 reform. So I think um, I think that's a good thing. So on to your second sort of idea, which is accountability. Um, so, you know, we've been discussing sort of like the representations of services, the sort of transparency, but how would the accountability plank work? Yeah, I think this is one where the Federal Trade Commission should and, and could really step up its scrutiny of big tech. So when you do go through that transparency or when you do have a representation made by um, a social media company about their level of neutrality or otherwise, um, I think a violation of that is something that could be uh, viewed through the FTC's deceptive and unfair trade practices perspective. Now, uh, the pushback to that is uh, I think FTC Chair Simons has said that that gets into sort of debates about political speech and political representations. And um, he said that he's not comfortable with the FTC going that route. I think some of this blends a bit more towards some of the commercial speech. Um, there's people that say, for instance, uh, Fox News, fair and balanced. There was an argument made to the FTC that they should step in and decide, you know, is Fox actually fair and balanced? Are they consistent with the representation? And the FTC back then decided not to get involved, I think in part because of some of the politics involved in it. So I would admit that enforcing some of these representations uh, can be difficult, can be thorny, but I think right now sort of not trying at all is, is not a viable path going forward. So finally, um, and I think this is actually the most interesting one, which is sort of the user empowerment section you sort of referenced this earlier with sort of allowing user filters. So yeah, so can you just sort of um, explain what that concept looks like? Yeah, so right now, you know, your feed can be, you know, Facebook, et cetera, uh, fact-checked by outside fact-checkers. I think a lot of people are skeptical that these are sort of true objective fact-checkers and not just uh, political actors or people pursuing their own agenda. So what I've suggested, and maybe we can do this through 230, maybe we can do it otherwise, maybe the market will do it, um, is to let people basically go into their settings. And if you, you know, want um, to have a, a third-party fact-check everything that you see, that doesn't offend me. You, you can you can click that button and do it. But why not let people opt out of that uh, and decide for themselves? If you want to see everything the president says without a screen over it or without um, it being taken down or you want to see an advertisement, um, why not let people have that sort of Wild West version uh, of Twitter? I, I think that could go a long way so that if Twitter or Facebook wants to continue to moderate your feed and really use other people's posts and other people's voices to potentially present you know, Twitter's view and Facebook's view, um, that's fine, but let people tap out of that as well and just get sort of the straight, um, you know, Wild West version. Do you think the status quo, and obviously there, there's there's controversy with fact-checking when it came to President Trump, but like on a broader level, do you, do you think the status quo of fact-checking is working? You know, it's a good question. Um, I think the entire fact-checking process is just fraught, right? You'll have you know, rules that they'll have, there'll be exceptions to rules. And I, again, I think that the better approach is just to get out of that business, let people make their own minds up about this. Um, people have plenty of access to plenty of information. Um, and so I, I just think it's fraught because it opens people up to um, people wanting to work the refs, right? So we've got this whole coalition that that wants um, these platforms, whether it's so-called hate speech or otherwise, to take down more content and you're just you're just never gonna satisfy everybody some people want more some people want less and i think if you can step back and get out of it um i, I think it's a far better path going forward so this is so i think the thing that's and i'm glad you brought up the working the refs comment but something that i just sort of worry here is that the demand for fact checking doesn't sort of come from nowhere, right? I don't think Mark Zuckerberg's dream when he made Facebook is that he would hire a bunch of underpaid contractors <laughs> to moderate platforms. And there's a reason why, if you sort of look at the rhetoric of Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg, it was like to your point, like the free speech sort of thing. And I think that's a genuine feeling that was there at sort of the inception of these projects. But 
the fact checking arrives for a reason because you have disinformation, you have misinformation, you have the Rohingya genocide in uh, Myanmar, obviously. So how? So, so the question then is, is: Is the Wild West version sustainable? I would submit that, that it is. I mean, I think that's, that's where these platforms started. I think that's where the conversations on these platforms started. And it's only been relatively recently, maybe the last year and a half or two years, that I think we've seen a significant veering towards um, fact checking. You saw you know, Facebook stood up their uh, sort of oversight board, what they call their Supreme Court. Um, and I just think going down this path is fraud. I think it is better to just, and, and I should say this, I can't really lump all the platforms together in one. I think Facebook has done a better job, in my view, of standing up for free expression and taking, uh, allowing more speech on the platform. But political speech is the issue. If you're talking about, you know, obscenities, if you're talking about, you know, extreme forms of violence, I think those are things that we could uh, really not have much objection to. I think the things that causes problems is when it's political speech, political advertisements, where I think more important there than anywhere else, let's let, you know, the public decide for themselves. So I think some of the content moderation around, you know, violence, obscenity, that sort of stuff, um, I don't think is as much a third rail as, you know, political speech. So the point is the, the controversy isn't, and that's actually a good point because the controversy post-16 hasn't been over moderating ethnic cleansing. It's really been when it's come to these edge cases around. So that's, that, that's a, I think that's a, that's a valuable point. So then the, the question then here is, could you speak to, and we'll transition. Thank you for the questions, everyone. We'll transition to those in, in a second. Could you speak to the sort of role that advertising, whether it's sort of political or monetary, is playing this sort of in, in this debate? Well, you know, when you look at the the advertising, political advertising market, you know, Facebook says it's it's a very small part of its uh, business model. And in fact, you know, it gets far more heat. Facebook says for for running political ads than it does money uh, from those political ads. But I do think if you if you step back from that particular issue, you know, the ad market generally is one where there's a lot of you know concern. And if you look at you know the website, the Federalist, for instance, um, uh, had their sort of you know advertising revenue. They got sort of demonetized over uh, the comments in the in the comment section. I think all that goes to concern about you know a, a concentration of market power when it comes to advertising revenue. And the other, and I'm kind of jumping around here, but the other element that's interesting for advertising is if you look at traditional uh, journalism, you know, whether it's uh, local newspapers, local radio, local television, sort of um, used to be real linchpins of localism, of news, and the ad dollars uh, that supported those platforms were just getting sucked away uh, into social media, just a massive movement. And I think that's contributed to what we've seen is the shutting down of local newspapers in uh, really communities by the dozen across the country. So I think, you know, the ad market is one that um, has a couple of different features to it that, uh, that um, are sort of under scrutiny right now. So the last question here is really, how does this become this sort of state of affairs, right? The focus on transparency, transparency, accountability, user empowerment, um, the sort of section 230 reforms, how does that, how does that become a sustainable bipartisan on some level sort of uh, policy order here? Because the sort of nightmare scenario that anyone would sort of, and I think this is one of the best arguments against anything here, which is basically at the end of the day, this is just going to lead to sort of hyper-politicization, which means that every four years, you're going to have a new sort of free speech regime. It's going to come into place and it's going to bounce back and forth. So how is this sort of sustainable? And maybe there isn't a quite answer there, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I think, so there's two things happening in the 230 debate. There are camps that feel like they're pulling on very different ends of the string, right? There's a camp that wants more speech. There's a camp that wants less speech for, for different reasons. But that's why I think you can maybe find some common ground around these principles of transparency, accountability, and user empowerment, because those are ones that I would hope, whether you're you know, Republican, Democrat, progressive, conservative, you could see as being helpful and not you know, overtly a thumb on the scale for one political party or one perspective. There's a lot of people, conservatives included, that are concerned. If we do 230 reform with Republicans in charge, does that mean Democrats are going to come in, do 230 reform in a way that's going to harm us? Um, and I guess there are ways you could do 230 reform that would do that. I don't see those on the table at the FCC right now. But that's why I think these principles of transparency and accountability, I would hope, would be ones that maybe we can get some more bipartisanship around. And I think there is some legislation in the Senate maybe designing to do that. But I think that's one path to 230 reform is less sort of substantive, but more 
Um, how do we have a better process around disclosures? I keep misrepresenting when I'm going to end my questions, but you keep saying things that interest me. So thank <laughs> you. Uh, so got to when I think of what's the most sort of generic, not even libertarian. Think of this sort of idea. It's the political one, which is what do we do when President AOC appoints someone to the FCC? Like, why would we want to give someone power? over that sort of um, over that sort of thing. It's th and this is why I'm glad we started with the debate about power and how the conservative movement is trying to think about how it reacts to it, because it's it's sort of I think of this as sort of the one ring and, you know, Lord of the Rings. This is something that will introduce bad things into the world. So how do you think about that? So I, I thought you cut out. Someone cut out is the point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, someone cut out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, yeah so again. the last basically, uh, did, did you, did you get the question? Yeah. So quick sum up of the question is you just sort of got to what is one of the principal conservative, not even libertarian objections to using the power of the state, the FCC and FTC in this case, which is that what happens when President AOC, to pick a bug, you know, particularly boogeyman. Yeah. I think part um, of this is, the, is the divide How, between to that idea? the quote unquote debate that we have about 230 about big tech on Twitter and uh, the actual text of what is in front of the FCC, right? So a lot of this sort of um, extremist views, you know, it's going to be the end of the internet. Um, it's going to be Armageddon if the FCC does anything, are picking up on uh, things that really aren't on the table. Again, what's narrowly on the table at the FCC is what is the relationship between C1 and C2? What does otherwise objectionable mean? Should we go for more transparency through a transparency rule? So I think the actual debate um, that's in front of the FCC is more narrow, is more technical, I think would do some good. Um, but it's not the, you know, end the Internet, you know, everything must be in favor of conservatives uh, or it's taken off the internet. Uh, that's not the actual debate that's before the FCC. Great. So we're going to go to questions finally. Um, so firstly from Ido, um, do you believe the FCC needs to preserve first amendment rights in social media? Secondly, what would you, what would it, what would make you support? So the first thing I antitrust support from the FCC is, is absolute and it's unwavering. And I think there's a lot of sort of confusion about people tying 230 and the First Amendment together, right? So the First Amendment is a baseline. We all have it. Newspapers have it. Libraries have it. But what those entities don't have is this special Section 230 reform. So even if we eliminated 230 altogether, which we can't do with the FCC, but if Congress did that, and if someone came in and said, hey, you can't do this on your platform, the platform would still say, you know, I got a First Amendment right and I was doing this because of the First Amendment. I wasn't doing this because of 230. So, yes, we absolutely always defend uh, the free speech rights. Um, we can also, I think, reform Section 230 without running afoul of First Amendment protections. Um, the second piece that was antitrust. I again, I'm not for sort of big structural antitrust reforms, but I do think that we can do a better job in terms of our modes of analysis. So, for instance, if you look at um, this Sprint T-Mobile merger that we looked at at the FCC, um, there was a lot of people that thought that that wasn't going to be a pro-competitive merger because they saw Sprint being this fourth competitor, a going concern. And our antitrust models assumed that Sprint was going to keep on going and being a competitor ad infinitum, right? But if you really peeled back the data, it was clear to me at least that Sprint was dead man walking um, and that combining the third and fourth provider was going to lead to more competition. And I think just briefly, the other side of that coin, perhaps, is Facebook, Instagram, where you see Instagram as a small photo sharing app. And maybe we didn't have the models to project out to see what Instagram could have been um, on its own six months or a year later. So I do think we can bring better models, um, uh, more dynamic, less static models to our antitrust review. And our analysis can be improved without necessarily needing to blow up all of antitrust thinking. So next question is from Sean um, at Team Lincoln. Do you see any similarities between the open data financial transparency at the federal agencies of transparency standards you have and are proposing at the FCC? Yeah, I'm not example, as, as familiar in the weeds with uh, maybe the, the specific one that's referenced there. But yeah, I do think as a general matter, you know, we see transparency across the board. And again, 
big tech is very, very unique. It's got massive power, massive size, and it exists in a regulatory vacuum. And I think it's fair game to say, you know, let's look at bringing some greater transparency. Again, we've got it for internet providers, which I think um, have far less power than it comes to big tech. Why not carry that forward to big tech? And so I think um, some of those examples that are out there might be good analogies. So this is from Kate. Even if you have a quote Wild West version, how do you address the consumer knowledge problem? I think this and the, and is to some extent a fundamental point. divide. Um, and I don't want to pigeonhole this particular questioner, but you tend to see this break down um, historically on, you know, conservative liberal um, uh, sides. And I'm someone that, you know, trusts people to filter through content, to make their own decision. And I don't think we should have the government um, you know, filtering content, stopping people from seeing stuff, deciding truth or not truth. Um, and frankly, from my personal perspective, again, I, I would prefer not to have um, these platforms doing that either. I, I fundamentally trust people to make their own minds up. And, and another example is there is this um, Bloomberg ad when he was running for president, uh, running through the Democrat nomination process that you may remember. And it sort of had him doing a zinger, a one liner at the debate. And there was this insert of you know crickets uh, chirping to sort of show that uh, it was a, a one liner that landed and no one had a response to. And yet all these people come on and say, look, you can't trust everyday people to realize that you know, crickets did not take to the stage and start chirping. We need a disclosure so that they know that was manipulated media. And again, my, my default is having a lot more faith in the American public to sort this out on their own. So this is interesting just to follow up on that. Do you are how. I don't want to make it seem like you're not concerned, but how how would you define your level of concern about things like because what someone would say is deep fakes. But like obviously you're picking this like you know cricket example, but there is a way to imagine higher stakes versions of that, especially in the context of coronavirus information, foreign actors, etc. How do you I'll put it this way? So there is no objective things? third party that makes these decisions when we are making decisions about truth or falsity it is always people in power people that are either fallible or people that have a political agenda that are making these decisions look just at um you know youtube's approach to uh health misinformation around covid right the the rule that they have adopted is you know whatever the who says goes and anything inconsistent with who um, is not going to be allowed on our platform well the WHO did not have a great track record in the in the lead off of this COVID pandemic in terms of parroting a lot of the uh, Communist Party of China propaganda. So I think it would be great potentially if you had you know uh, sort of the the, the oracle of, of of truth that you could appeal to, but you can't. You can only appeal to people in power. I think that's a, a fundamental structural problem that again produces to me the result of let's trust people more than third party quote unquote fact checkers. Great. So this is from Carl. What are your thoughts on Twitter's decision to ban political? You know, yeah, I think there's an element of this that approach. Um, gives an advantage to incumbent politicians that have large social media following. So they don't need to do an advertisement, a paid placement. They can just spread that same message out to their followers without advertisements. Um, you know, upstart candidates that you know can't get on local TV, let alone national TV. So I think that the problem there is you know putting a thumb on the scale of people that already have the ability to command uh, you know media coverage. So I think whether it's a more targeted approach or I think Facebook's approach of letting that type of stuff generally go through is better in terms of leading to competition to incumbent uh, politicians. Great. And then final question from Sean. Regional broadcast market domination has been the cause to regulatory limitations on commercial broadcasters. Is the current situation not unlike that? I'm not sure I follow the, the analogy entirely. I mean, we, you know, we certainly have a high concentration of uh, power and market dominance in big tech right now. And I think that is a lot of why we're seeing um, calls for reform. Um, there is room for competition, right? Again, I mentioned Parler stepping in and um, potentially taking market share from Twitter. So there's still room, but there's still just massive scale that comes with uh, Google and Twitter and, and uh, 
the ability to leverage uh, sort of dominant positions in the ad market that I think calls for greater scrutiny. Again, some of that is outside the, the jurisdiction of the FCC. And I think that, you know, 230 is important, um, but I think it's only part of, of bringing some broader scrutiny to bear here. So that's actually a good place to end on because I'm sort of wondering, we sort of talked about things that we sort of see the government doing, but the parlor example brings up free market alternatives. But I think depending on your perspective, parlor's either been an encouraging or discouraging reality because on the one hand, you did sort of see this alternative pop up. On the other hand, you could say a lot of people didn't leave because there are network effects. You know, you have, you don't have the ability to like import your Twitter followers to a new platform. So how do you think the, how, in what ways do you think the market will independently or maybe even proactively address any the of scale concerns. that we see with big tech um, is something that is is hard to address um, from sort of a parlor style competition i think parlor is part of the solution i'm on parlor you can follow me there brendan carr uh, usa um, but i think it's going to require broader reform as well so i think it's going to take parlor style competition i think it's going to take 230 reform i think it's going to take uh, federal trade commission um, stepping up in terms of enforcement with some of these public commitments. Um, and again, you see antitrust agencies as well looking at ad market and search market. So I do think um, there's just nothing like it when you have just this massive scale effect. It's not like Joe's plumber and he's, you know, getting a consumer one after the other and, you know, building a business. Um, there, there's something to the scale that big tech has that requires both competition and I think updating our approach through 230. So what would your final, so I'll give you sort of open mic for the last sort of minute here. What would your sort of main takeaway from this, from both, from both your, your, your op-ed, which come out, came out over a month ago, this sort of conversation and the public comment period ending tomorrow. What is your sort yeah, of- Yeah, I do think things are, are shifting. I think we're seeing more support, uh, more support sort of from established um, entities for Section 230 reform. Just uh, recently, uh, Senator Blackburn, Senator Wicker, and Senator Graham put forward a bill to reform Section 230, and it's hard to get more establishment typically than Senator Graham. So it's good to see uh, that type of support for, for 230 reform. But look, I think this was a law that was passed in the, the 1990s. In fact, it was, it's not just something I think about. Um, I think things have changed a lot since then, and you get these court decisions that I think have, have moved away from some of the core terms in 230. So my sort of bottom line would be, let's you know look at the actual debate before the FCC, which is technical, C1, C2, what do these words mean? Um, and I would focus there, but I think some of the rhetoric about, you know, it's the end of the internet, uh, any reform would, you know, uh, you know, lead to the end of Facebook or Twitter. I think that rhetoric is overblown, um, but I think people should continue to participate in the FCC's proceeding. If you don't want us to do anything, you know, let us know. You know, not every idea that we have is a, is a great idea, but we, we welcome um, the robust participation in the FCC's process. Oh, there's actually a quick last Q&A here. Um, at what point, by Matt, at what point might the virtual world of platforms be treated as communities or clubs? In other words, could the FCC acknowledge self-governance of an online community as a different standard for content? This is a good question. You talk about clubs. There is uh, supposedly the social media platform Clubhouse, which I've not been allowed to uh, to get into yet. Um, people always uh, uh, laud that when they're into that particular um, social media platform. But you know, these platforms are very different than the CompuServe and Prodigy messaging boards. You know, there the business model was about sort of selling airtime, selling connection time. And then the messaging board, the chat rooms were sort of an adjunct. And, you know, the business model shifted to be all about, you know, today's version of the chat room and all about moderation and curation. Each platform is sort of presenting you uh, with its view um, of what it wants you to see based on these content moderations. So I do think the entire business model around moderation is different. Um, and, and so I do think that there can be some more um, sharpening of our approach to 230, but um, that's kind of where I am at this point. Well, Commissioner Carr, thank you for joining us and thank you to everyone who participated in our first reboot conversation. There'll be many more. Thanks much. Come. We will see you all soon. Thank you.